Welcome everyone to OTF webinars. Tonight, purposeful practice activities with scratch coding. I just love that title. Don't we all want that purposeful in practice? All right. And your presenter tonight is uh, Scott McKenzie, who's from my home board. So I know firsthand that you've got one of the keenest coders around to lead you through tonight. In fact, he's so keen, he's sitting at his school just so that he has a good, strong, hardwired connection. My job tonight is going to be to help facilitate this. I'll be dropping links into the chat box for you and trying to answer any questions that need answering. And uh, basically enjoying this one with you as well. I'm going to be trying some of these coding activities too. So it's time now to turn it over to Scott. Enjoy your presentation, folks. Hello, good evening. I hope everyone can hear me. And it's a pleasure to be here with you tonight. Uh, so, I am Scott McKenzie, and I teach in the WRDSB. Uh, I have my Twitter handle on there. So, after tonight, if there's anything that you're trying in class and you want to just, something's not working or you have a question about something, just DM me and direct message me on Twitter, and I'll do my best to get back to you as quickly as possible and hopefully sort out whatever you're having trouble with. Um, so a question I get a fair bit, especially from people who haven't tried it, is is always why coding? Like why should we use coding? There's other ways we can do this, which is absolutely true. And there are excellent ways to do many math activities like playing games and uh, just having those different experiences and real life experiences as well. But coding is just another tool. It's another way we can do it. And the computational thinking is something that students that might go into engineering or might go into science, it's really an excellent way for them to start to think through that process and to start to develop those skills. So I think that it's very useful. Creativity is a big choice and option for students when they're coding because it's such an open platform. So those students that like to be creative, even the students that like to be artistic, there's so many opportunities for them to use those strengths while at the same time strengthening their math abilities and their computational abilities as well. What I love is the design process. I've been having my students really focus and think about that when working through their coding. So they're doing it for an authentic audience. And that's a really excellent way to have them focus their thinking about what they're making and why they're making it. And I believe that math and language, both important subjects, blend together very nicely when we're doing a coding activity like building a game or creating an interactive uh, script where you interact with the program and you're answering questions, but there's math involved as well. And of course, any of this coding that they do, they will carry it on to the real world where they could literally be building video games someday and building their own apps, which they can put on an app store. Not as hard as people think to do. It's actually something that's fairly easy to do. So that they could be doing in just a couple more years if they stick with it. I always like to talk about the mathematical processes because it's so easy to show how coding relates to these. And in the math curriculum, this is exactly the exact um, quote from the math curriculum. And so problem solving, reasoning, improving, and reflecting. I think all of the processes come out in coding, but especially these three, because they have to problem solve to get things to work. And constantly students will come up and say, OK, I can't figure it out. I, I need gravity in this program. I need the, the character to be, the sprite to be falling, and I can't figure it out. And so they're problem solving. And I say, well, tell me, tell me what you've tried so far, and why didn't it work, and what have you not tried, or what could you try next, and then maybe just giving them a, what if you went and used this code block, how could you use that? So they have to reason through and think about what didn't work and what might work. And talking through that gets them to really think about what they're doing. So there's a lot of reflecting that goes on while they do that. And then I just highlighted below problem solving and communicating. So as the students work through these challenges that I give them in class, they're constantly talking to each other. And I, I encourage that. It's very rarely a quiet classroom because they're constantly trying something, talking to someone else, getting an idea, running something past someone, and then they go on back and they're working again. 
So as they do that, they're kind of using all the different processes naturally because it just comes out in the way that they communicate and the way they work through the problems. So as students engage in reasoning, teachers further encourage them to make conjectures and justify solutions. And so eventually we want them to do that in writing. And I'll have my students do that. So after they code something or create something, I will have them self-reflect on what did you learn from this or what did you improve in your own abilities as, as you built this? Or what was the challenge that really slowed you down that you had to work through? Uh, sometimes it's just doing something like building a game and then I challenge them by saying, what math did we use here? What if the principal came down and, and wanted to know what purposeful math we were doing while doing this activity? And so then having them think about their learning, which is a, a great opportunity for them. Um, we hear a lot about failure and students' fear of failure. Um, tinkering in math, the link is here. This is just a blog post uh, from back in 2014 by Dana Ernst. And he was influenced uh, from that, an inquiry-based an inquiry-based learning blog, uh, so inquiry-based learning, which has been a buzzword for a while. This was like how it's used in secondary and post-secondary, and this was again back in 2014, but all about mathematics class and how inquiry-based learning can be used in the mathematics class, and in encouraging students to tinker, and I really like the word tinker, because when we're working on programming, oftentimes you're tinkering with code. You're trying a different, uh, you know, block stack to see if that works better. You're adjusting numbers to see if it changes, makes something uh, quicker, faster, or, you know, more fluent when they're, the game is running. And all those different things, we want to naturally carry that over to math so that hopefully in an intelligent way, they are making mistakes that work them closer to the solution so that as they move through it, they can see by their mistakes the right path to take to eventually get to the right answer. And so instead of being afraid of the mistakes, they welcome them and they even are encouraged to make mistakes and then look at those mistakes and say, oh, I see, I've done this, this didn't work, but I now understand that this isn't working, so I could try this. So getting them to really talk through that process is huge. Um, I won't spend any more time on that tonight. Just the questions that he had that I thought were great was how do we encourage students to tinker with mathematics? And my answer, of course, would be we use coding. And how do we destigmatize mistakes in the mathematics classroom? I always talk to students that it's like the iteration process in coding so that we never get everything right the first time and we work through the process and we refine things as we go along. And I liken that to solving a math problem. Um, so we'll move on from there, but I encourage you to check that out at a later date. Coding games with design thinking. So design thinking, I kind of put this together myself here just to talk about what it specifically is like when you're talking about coding. So for the students, they'll often discuss with a partner what game they want to make. And then after they've discussed it and sat down and kind of designed what it should be like, what it's going to look like, then they go to the creation phase. And so in the creation phase, they have to do the computational thinking that creates their game. And there's always math there, which we'll look at in a bit. But they put things together, and then the next step is to play. So they play the game. They get someone else to play the game. They get feedback. They get someone to talk to them about, well, I really like this about the game, but I couldn't get this to work. Or uh, I found it really easy to cheat, because if I just went and hung up in the corner, then nobody caught me. So all that feedback is helpful, and then the students have to iterate and change their, pro their project slightly. So they tweak their design, they recreate it, they work away at it, and they chip away at the design until they get it to be a polished final product. And so that can be different depending on who they're creating it for as well. So sometimes that iteration process will go through multiple stages as they create the game for someone in their own class, but then for someone in an older class or someone who's in kindergarten. So there's a lot of different ways that they can think about it. And having that end user in mind is, is a very good way to have them start to think about what coding might be like in the real world. 
I'm not seeing any questions pop up, so if there are no questions, I'm going to move on. And just so I know how fast to go tonight and where we're starting, if you could let me know your comfort level with coding, you can do this either in the chat box with a number or you can put a smiley face or one of the other icons, people who are enjoying the icons, up um, beside or around or up over top of number one, number two, number three, number four, and number five. Okay, I'm wondering if that's a coding ninja down there with the mouse. No, okay, comfortable coder. Excellent, thank you very much. So generally speaking, we're in the tinkerer, comfortable coder range, which is good. So if at some point I'm going too fast tonight or you can't see something that I'm doing once I screen share, if you could please put that up in the chat. Hopefully Trish can catch it. I won't be able to see when I'm screen sharing, but I will be happy to slow down or to explain what I'm doing because it's very important that you can take this process and take it right to your class and work with your class. So please let me know if I'm going too fast and if I'm going too slow, which probably won't, but hey, you never know. Okay, so the first program we're going to look at tonight, this works on students adding by threes and fives and they have to get to an, a final answer of 48 to win the game. So obviously you can change the threes, you can change the fives, you can change the final score of 48, but this is just a starting place. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take you to the game. Trisha will put the link in. You can just try out the game and then we'll go from there. I'm going to go there myself now and we'll check it out. Okay, and hopefully you can see my screen right now. Yes, okay. So there's a little message at the beginning. It says capture the numbers until your score is equal to 48. And then I control the ladybug, and hopefully you're trying this too, but I control the ladybug by just moving the mouse pointer around. Super easy to use. So the design is actually set up so that it would work for younger students. So they could just move the mouse around and have the ladybug follow it. Now there is a glitch in this program and the glitch is that if the number is touching the ladybug when it first appears, then it won't disappear. And this is a scratch glitch as opposed to a, uh, this is just a glitch in the program as opposed to the way that the script is, is running. So it's not something we can change unfortunately. But other than that, everything else works. And if you ladybug isn't touching anything when it appears, then you're good. So students will have to pay attention to the score and they have to figure out, do I need a five or a three? And you get them starting to think ahead. Okay, there is 38. I need two fives to get 48. And I don't want the minus 10. I want to get fives. So they can work through the process. And I need one more five that hasn't touched my ladybug at the beginning. And I got the answer. So good adding. And then it moves on to a second stage. So let's build this ourselves. I'm going to have you go to Scratch now. And if you don't have a Scratch account, that's OK. Um, I would strongly suggest making one. And a teacher account would be best, which I can show you how to do a little later. But this is just for us to try it now. If you have an account and you log in, then you will be able to save your project. And I'm automatically logged in, so I'm going to actually log out. 
and then just work from here. So please let me know if I'm going too fast and I'll, I'm keep trying to keep an eye on the chat here while I work away. So first things first, uh, I don't need these. These will show up um, when you first start and these are excellent. So these step-by-step -step instructions will walk through students through different different programs and it teaches them programming concepts and they're, they're great. Uh, so I would suggest if you give your students an opportunity to try something and you want them to try it on their own, these are great starting places. Scratch never used to have this and it's, it's so much better because it has these tutorials now. They've been around for a couple of years now. So this here is where I put all my scripts or all my block coding. This will run my sprite. Uh, right now I'm on the scripts tab. If I switch to costumes, this allows me to change costumes. We'll be using that tonight. You can also add sounds. Students love to do that. We're not going to do that tonight, but it's something students could explore. They can record and they, there's a ton of sounds that they can pick in Scratch. Oh, wrong place, sorry. There's a ton of sounds that they can pick in Scratch, which are a lot of fun when they're playing a game. So they, if you give them the option to explore those, they'll have a great time with that. So in the scripts, the first thing I'm going to do actually is get rid of the cat. And there's different ways to do that. Here's the sprite down here. I can right click on the cat or on a Mac, it's two finger tap or a Chromebook to delete. Um, I can also tap on it up here on the stage to delete it. And I can also hit the scissors up here and delete it up here as well and just click on the cat. So those are three different ways I can make the cat go away. And then I'm going to click on new sprite and I'll pick the ladybug again just because I like the way the ladybug turns to kind of face the mouse as it moves around. It doesn't really matter what you pick, but I'm picking the ladybug. And then I'm going up to here where we have a shrink and a grow option and I'm going to click on shrink. And my ladybug's a bit big right now, so I'm going to put it in the middle of the sprite and shrink it down to a more reasonable size. Now, I also need to get those nice numbers. So if I go to ball and I select ball, this can be one of the numbers. And now I'm switching over to costumes. And I can take that ball, which has that kind of shiny 3D looking look to it right now. If I come down here, I might want to pick just a plain red color. And then I can go to the paint bucket here and fill it. And then I can either with the text box or you can, students sometimes prefer to draw. I can use the text box to insert a number here. Uh, so we'll stick with the numbers we've made previously. Five's hard to see, so I just highlight it and I change my ink color to black by clicking on black. And then I can drag this down and put it in the center-ish of the ball. So now I've got a five. And then if I just take my ball and I right click, I can duplicate this sprite over here and create ball two. And then I just go back to the ball itself I can delete the 5 and change it to a 3. And I can select a different color for this. Oh, I've got green. Didn't mean to do that. Hold on. So I can click on the ball itself, get the paint bucket. Actually, I'm not sure if this will cover the 3 up or not. No, it doesn't. Okay, good. So there, I've got a 5 and a 3, just like that. If anyone's completely lost or I've left you behind, could you please say something in the chat just so that I could go over anything that has been missed? And I'm clicking back on the, the scripts tab and now I have these two balls and I have my beetle and I am ready to code.
So we'll go back to our beetle first. And when the green flag is clicked, I am going to wait three seconds. And the reason I'm going to wait three seconds is because at the beginning, for three seconds, there's going to be a message that we put in a little later that says, uh, you must add up to, you must capture the balls to add up to 48. So wait three seconds. And then I'm going to have it under motion, point towards mouse pointer, and then move so many steps. And steps are pixels on the screen. And these two will have it follow my mouse cursor around. And I'm going to put these into a forever loop so that it'll keep moving. Now, what's also really important in this game is the score. So score is basically a variable. So I go to data, click make a variable, which I'm going to call the score, oops, <laughs> or the Scott. And this is for all sprites. It, it doesn't really, yeah, we'll just leave it for all sprites. In some games, you might want to make it for one sprite only. It just depends on how the game works. You might have a one sprite that takes health away from you. And so each time that it touches you, it, it, increase, it decreases your health. And then there's different, more complex ways to use this later. But for now, for all sprites, we're going to have score. And I click OK. So here's score. I can pull this out and drop it into an equation, an operator block. And I can also now set the score to 0 at the beginning of the game. So I'm going to put right at the top. So everything runs in order. When the green flag is clicked, it will set the score back to zero and wait three seconds. Then, forever, I want it to point towards the mouse pointer and move three steps. Now you can test all of this simply by clicking the green flag and then seeing if the beetle is following the mouse pointer. So OK, so far, so good. Now. Students will have to experiment with this and see, well, what if I move 10 steps at a time? How does that work? And so this happens. So with older students, it would definitely make the game more challenging if they have to control a sprite that's moving much quicker. I find three steps to be much more manageable at the beginning. Um, then we're going to say, an if then statement under control. So if, and here's what we're going to say the score about the score. So if the score equals something, to do that, I go to operator blocks and I'm going to pull out an equals block. And under data, we had created this variable score. So score is a variable that can be anything. And so we're now going to tell the program what score should equal. So if score equals 48, then. So it's going to say, you did it. For two seconds. And then if you do a second stage, which you can see in the program later, you would you would have it broadcast to the second stage. But what we're going to do here is just stop all and kind of end the game here. So again, and hopefully everyone can see what I've got on the screen. But there's the code stack so far. Not seeing any questions, so I'm going to keep going if everyone's OK so far. So now I move to ball three. And for ball three, under events, when the green flag is clicked, I have to put a show block in because at some point here, I'm going to ask the three ball to hide. So when the green flag is clicked, show, and then forever, 
forever is not something we would use in real life life uh, programming because forever is never really a good code block. Um, having a robot run forever at Toyota and never stopping is really not a great thing because at some point that line shuts down. Um, however, in Scratch, it's a block we use just to have something run. And what it really means is for the entire time that this program is running, do the following things continuously. So just to kind of clarify that. But forever, during this program running, and we're going back to an if-then block. And so if, and we need a sensing block. Sensing blocks will sense different things that might be interacting or happening in the program. If touching, and I can select any other sprite except the three ball. So if touching the beetle, then I would like it to, going to data, change score by one. And then once it's changed the score by one, I would like it to hide. And I will stop this script as well. That's important because if it hides, it's still there. So you could have a score being run up by invisible balls. So stopping this script only will stop this script happening for the first ball. Now, there were multiple balls showing up. And the way that I got multiple balls was I pulled out uh, when I start as a clone. And when I start as a clone, I want it to show. Hey, Scott, you got a couple of questions. OK, uh, I'll go check. All right. Uh, Scott, why the stop all? Stacy, so it's not stop all. It's stop this script only. Um, stop all is to stop the entire game. So once they reach 48, the stop all is to finish the game completely. And in this particular instance here, with the three ball, I'm capturing one of the three balls, so I'm only stopping the script for that three ball that was caught by the beetle. Is there a specific script associated with a sprite? Like when I change sprites, my code gets lost. Um, yes, so the script that I, I'm putting in for the beetle only works for the beetle. It's the code for the beetle. Uh, it can react with other things, but it's for the beetle. And when I put the code in for, for this three ball, the first three ball that shows up, this is the code only for that three ball. And Stacy, did I answer your question? Okay, awesome. Thank you. All right, sorry. Uh, once I'm coding, I kind of lose track of the chat. Um, so once I start as a clone, I'll make this a little bigger. Maybe that'll be helpful too. Uh, when I start as a clone, I need to show and forever I'm going to glide. So go to motion and pull out a glide. Uh, just as also, so you know, like when we're finished here, you'll have links to all these programs that are built so you can go back and check everything. So please don't feel pressure to get everything perfect tonight, but it will be available later for you. So glide at six seconds. Now, I don't want it to go to a specific place because and we could see what that looks like, but it won't be very exciting. It'll just go to this spot slowly, because six seconds is a slow glide, and then it'll stick there. So what I really want it to do, now I'm going to the operators blocks, and I'm going to pull out, pick random, and I'm going to right duplicate it, and stick one in the Y and one in the X. Now, just to be clear, X is moving across the screen from left to right, and there's 480 pixels in total. Zero is the middle of the screen, so it can go anywhere from minus 240 to positive 240. And for Y, it's moving up and down, and it is moving through 360 degrees of total distance, which is 
180 degrees to minus 180 degrees. So I'm putting that in here as well. And then that clone will just continue to move around all over the screen. And now I also want my first ball to do the exact same thing. So I'm going to right click right over top of the forever block and it's going to give everything I just put in for the clone and I now have it for the first ball and for any clones that I make. So what does that look like? So there's the three moving around and here's my beetle. So I encourage the students to test each part of the code to make sure it works. So the score increased by one. Now later I can say to students, are there any bugs in this program I've created so far? And I, I, I recognize the fact that the beetle is a bug, obviously, but they know what I mean. They know I'm looking for errors or things that aren't correct in my script. So tell me, can you see anything I'm doing wrong so far? I captured the three ball and changed my score. Okay, I'm seeing some more things. Uh, do you give students the steps to create a game or do you give them the chance to figure out how to make it move themselves, the beetle? Um, Melanie, I give scaffolded projects at the beginning and as the year moves on, I give them less and less scaffolding so they do more and more of it by themselves. So at the beginning of the year, I would show them a program like this, but then later I would ask them to use this to create something a little different. So they, they gain more independence as the year goes on. And you're correct, it's not an accurate score, so I've only got a score of one even though I captured the three ball. So right away, I've got a error to fix. I've actually put an error in the finished product too. Does it all add up? It's not an error that causes any problems in the game, but it's an efficiency thing. So if you notice that later, you could always DM me if you've noticed it. So I've said what to do when you start as a clone, but I haven't said how to create a clone. So we're going to do that now. Pull out when green flag clicked and a forever block. And students do it all the time where they don't put a forever block. And what happens is when you start the program on green flags, it will instantly check for whatever you said down here. So right here, if touching the beetle, change score by three. If I don't put the forever loop in, at the very beginning when I click the green flag, at that exact moment, if the three ball is touching the beetle, it'll change the score. But after that exact moment where I click the green flag, it will not change the score. That's why we have to use the forever block. So when green flag clicked, forever, and then we put in a wait of 10 seconds because the first ball is going to move around for 10 seconds and then after that 10 seconds we're then going to add a new ball and you might notice it down here create clone of myself and that's all I need now you'll notice this here when green flag click forever if touching beetle change score by three hide and stop this script the other beetle will move around the screen but we haven't given it all of this and we do need to include that. So when I start as a clone, and again, I'm going to use that right click duplicate. It just speeds things up and I'm going to pull that script over here. So it's the exact same script, but for the clone. Now, some people sometimes ask, why do you have more than one little script running with the green flag clicked or with when I start as a clone? And I've just found that it's less glitchy. I keep them separate, so if there's a problem with one thing, it doesn't hang up anything else that I've asked it to do. So having these different little functions all running at the same time works just fine. I'm just going to check in for questions again. Can you explain the clone block? So you make a clone of any sprite just by using that block. Yes. And you can create a clone of actually any of the sprites, which is kind of neat. So any of the sprites can trigger this clone function. 
So there's a lot of different ways you can use this in, in games. It's actually a really great time saver. So Space Invaders, I, um, I was talking to a Google engineer one time, and he, he was very interested in Scratch, but he said, oh my goodness, the amount of extra code that students are using is, is too bad. He said, for Space Invaders, this student made thousands of scripts, he said, but really he could have just coded one of the creatures and then created the rest as clones. And so sometimes it's, it's seeing the efficiency of something like using when I start as a clone. OK, um, want to keep moving just so we get to other stuff tonight. I'm going to kick the green flag again. After three seconds, my beetle is going to move. I'm going to send him down to try and capture the three. He got it. OK, now another one's going to show up. Oh, there we go. All right. So it's fully functioning. Now, I'm going to stop there because I believe that you could go to the, the five ball and you could do the same thing. Uh, just something I'm going to show you to save you some time. See this whole thing here? I'm clicking at the top. Oh, I better press stop, actually. I'm going to grab this from the green flag. And if I take this, I can drag the whole thing over and just drop it over top of the five. And when I switch over to the five ball, it's in there. So I don't have to start from scratch again. I hope someone's laughing at my bad jokes out there. And then I just change the score to five, switch back to the three ball, and I can grab the next thing, drag that over, drop it in. And so this is a quick way to drag everything over and, and put it all in the right spot. Again, you just change the, the threes to fives, and that's pretty much all you have to change. Um, for doing the, the, the typing, the writing, uh, all I did was, I clicked on New Sprite. I went to, you can use any of these buttons. Sometimes the students create in Google Drawings, they create different shapes for kind of speech bubbles, and they bring them over. But button three, OK, and this is where I did my typing. I just switched to costumes. And you can pick different colors, and you can increase the size to make it a reasonable size to put your writing in. And then the text box, and you just type in whatever you want to say there. And then I would have this show for three seconds and then hide. And I'm going to leave it there unless anybody wants me to do anything else. Oh, thanks for the, the canned laughter. That's great. OK, um, so moving on, if there's no questions. And Catherine, just seeing your question now, I teach grade 3, 4. So we'll close this. We will not save any changes. Oh, look what happened here. Isn't that awesome? Clones. Attack of the clones. OK. So now we will go to Trish, if you don't mind, I will switch back for a second here. And OK, and what we're actually going to do, we're not going to do the 15 magic squares first. What we're actually going to do is the red dots. So Trish will put the link for red dots. And I'll show you. This is kind of the starting place. And I'll show you how we can ramp it up to make it more complex. So if you want to go to OTF red dots, and that will open up the project page. Uh-oh. OK, just a bit of a glitch. I'm trying this again. There we go. Sorry about that. OK, here comes my desktop. OK. I'm just going to leave this open so I'll be able to get back. And away we go. OK, so red dots. And here's the instructions. This is a great place to have students work on their writing, because clear instructions is really important. Click each sprite to put a red dot inside. You should have at least five red dots altogether. Each row should have one box with no red dot. 
So this is a little math problem for the students. So if you want to just try it right now, how could you put a red dot in each column, in each row, leaving one blank in each column, in each row? So for the students, they have to figure this out. Thanks, Stacy. If you remix this, then you'll have it for later. So if you try this, if you click on the boxes, I have to leave an open square in each column in each row. So this might be a good starting uh, little math challenge for students, something to get them thinking at the beginning of the day. How can I leave at least So have I done it correctly? Does that work? Have I put two red dots in each column in each row? And what I had my students do after this was I had them change the game, or not the game, but just this little problem. So. I had them go to the costumes and duplicate the costume here. And then this red circle, I had them change the color to a different color, like blue. And then if they did that on each of these, it gave them the option of having two colors. So what they would then have to do is put two colors in each row. And then if that wasn't too hard to do, then they again added, and then it was three colors in each row, which is a bit more challenging. So three colors in each row means it would have to be a red, a blue, and a pink in each column in each row. So then they're really starting to think about it. So I'm going to move on and two in each row column, and red dots. So if you just click on that quickly, what I want to point out here, and that's the changing so there's more than one costume, but one of the challenges I gave my students was, can you use this to build a better game of tic-tac-toe? And so once we had tried the, the three colors, then these are some of the remixes here. And some of my students created it from scratch rather than remixing mine. But just um, so tic-tac-toe, they switched it to being X's. Uh, for this student, she added three shapes to each one. And then you had to get four in a row. So just the creativity of the students starts to come out. And they, they, when they remix, you can see on the remix tree here on your project page, you can see all the remixes that they do based on your program. So they start to show up here, which is kind of nice. And that way you can go back afterwards and you can see what they've created. Um, just to go a bit more advanced with this, uh, sorry, what we can do now is we can go to 15. So Trish, if you could please put the OTF uh, 15 I'm going to sign in. Thank you, Trish. So, Here we go. And what's changed here is now the costumes for each hey, sprite, which is still the same boxes. Refresh? I think your screen is frozen. Yeah. Mine is. OK. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, everyone.
hasn't worked yet. Okay, I'm going to uh, switch back to the slideshow for a second and try doing that way. Okay, we're getting a full screen again? Yep, that's better. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Okay, so here in this program now, uh, what's been added is numbers. And I've done this both with uh, typing the numbers in the middle. Students seem to prefer just drawing the numbers. It's quicker and uh, easy. So they just they duplicate the costume, and then they just change out the number. Often what they do is they use the erase tool, and they erase what's here. And you can change the size of your eraser. And then they erase whatever's there, and then they just add it in with the pencil or the paintbrush. So this was the, the two. And then if I think that's too thin, the line, I can change the thickness of the line right here. So I kind of, it'll bug me if I have that skinny little two. So I'm just going to put a thicker one in. That might be too thick. So switch back to the paintbrush. And then we just put the number in there. So students put these different numbers from 1 to 9, and then we go back to scripts. And I don't know if you've seen these before. I, I think a lot of people have. But just these are magic squares. So in a magic square, you try to get the numbers in each column and each row to add up to 15. So for my students, by the time we did all of this, they never asked me which way was a column, which way was a row anymore, because it was pretty solid in their mind. But um, then what you do from here, you click the green flag, and then you try to get everything to add up to 15. And for most, if you have an older class, if you have grade 5 or grade 6, you might want to give them one of my partially built programs, which you will have in the, in the links you're given at the end of the session. You might want to give them a partially built project and have them build the rest of the code. This one's a bit more complex. Uh, the coding. So you might want to just play it at first with your students and then have them tweak or tinker with the code to change what the score would be. So on the third box in each row, sprite 3, you can see here's the extra code. So we've got set box to costume of sprite 2, costume number of sprite 2. And forever set row 1 to box 1 plus box 2 plus box 3. And again, that's data. So here I've started to add more data. And adding all that data in, box 1 lets me tell the program what box 1 equals. And to do that, uh, what it has to do is I have to tell it that box 1 represents the costume number of the sprite. And because I can't do sprite 1, I can't have sprite 1 talk about sprite 1. So I actually have to have sprite 2 talk about sprite 1. I have to have sprite 3 talk about sprite 2. And then I have sprite 1 talk about sprite 3. Sounds a little convoluted, but if you look through the code later, if this is of interest to you, you'll see what I mean. And then for students, though, for problem solving, especially in the older elementary grades, this is a great place for them to start to have to think through all that. There's a lot of computational thinking to put this all together. But starting with a partially built project makes it easier for them to put things together. Um, and then th what they can start to do is they can start to change what it should add up to. So have them look through. How would I change it so that it's not supposed to equal 15 anymore? And then they can change it. And actually, it, it's easy to change because 15 is an arbitrary number at this point because there's nothing stopping the whole program, uh, but it's just them themselves trying to add it up. So have them try to think of, could I have the whole program stop when all the scores reach a certain amount? And so there's a lot of challenges you can give to them from something that started really simply with just red dots. So this is something I would have students use as is. And it's built upon the earlier project. And then they could customize their own. And I would have them do it on paper first. So they would create a magic square. And they could even start with just the four boxes. 
if your students are really strong, you could have them add an extra row and an extra column so that there's a row of four and a column of four um, going across and then have them have a different score and they have to figure out the right numbers and then they might take out some numbers or add higher numbers to make it work. So there's a lot of ways that they could build upon this um, without having to reinvent or redo all the code, but they could start to expand it and they add on to what's already there. So this is definitely a tinkering one as opposed to having them build it from scratch. Is there any questions about this program? Okay. I'm just going to have hop back on here. So The 15 challenge is the, do you mention the coding work in the report cards? Ah, um, yeah, but usually it just in math or language generally, I'll talk about if it was something that they used uh, as a whole class. In my classroom, I teach coding. I teach different things. I usually do it once a week or once or twice a week, depending on what we're doing. And then when we're doing a project, they have choices. So some students might build a website. Other students might code a project. Other students might do a slideshow. Other students might do a poster. So it kind of depends on what they did. But if they did use coding a fair bit, then absolutely I would, I would talk about that in a report card, yes. So here you have the completed project, the OTF 15 complete, which you'll have access to. And you have the 15 challenge. That's a partially built program where I believe I put the rows in and they have to build the columns. And so they're using the code from the rows and they're applying it and switching it to the columns. Any students grade four, five, and six, that wouldn't be too hard for them to put together. Time-wise, we're okay. So I'm, I'm trying to stay on time tonight. Racing cars, this is the next project and this one here I have a video tutorial so if you wanted a really easy place to start with your students and you haven't done much in class this would be a good place to start um, and I'll show you that in just a second you have the completed project here and then you have the partially completed project so the completed project is to go and for yourself and just see everything put together and for your students I would introduce the partially completed project I've done this from everywhere from grade one students up to grade six students. And so everyone was able to use this uh, in, in different, with a different scaffolding depending on the grade. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take you to the partially completed project and we'll work our way through. Okay, so right here in the instructions, you'll note that there's a video tutorial here. And as much as I hate the sound of my own voice, I'll just quickly show you. Okay, now we're going to make a small project where we're going to race two sprites across the stage. We're going to do a little bit of art when we do this, although it's pretty simple. I'm sure you'll have better art ideas than I do. And so uh, you can use this later with your class if you want to have the students watch the video and pause it on a screen in the class and then they can work through the project. It's a nice easy way to get started. Um, and then down here I have questions right in here. So how can you tweak the speed distance of your butterflies car to, to win easier or harder? And how can you make the competitor sprite car travel faster or slower. There are extra blocks so you can change the math from addition to subtraction, multiplication, or division. And we'll see those when we click on C inside. So here's the project itself. And right now I'm on the butterfly, which is pre-created for the students, so it's slightly scaffolded. And then right here, when I receive go, so another sprite is broadcasting a message and it's, it starts different things. So like on your microwave, 
after the program finishes turning the turntable, it sends, it broadcasts a little message to make a beep sound start so that your microwave beeps. So here, there's another sprite, which is the arrow actually, which is going to send out the message go. And when I receive go, I'm going to move 20 steps. And then forever, if I'm touching the edge, I'm going to say I won for two seconds and then stop all. Just so I don't mess with this program, I'm, getting, I'm logged in. I'm just going to save as a copy. Now, any changes I make on my own program that I'm sh I might be showing students, because I've created a copy, the original that I created for students doesn't change. So if you're creating programs for your students, saving it as a copy when you're sharing with them stops your original program from getting all the changes made as you make them. So if I click on the arrow, Here's where all the fun stuff is. So when the green flag is clicked, forever, and then we've got our data blocks here. And this is all done for you and done for the students. But we've got correct, number one, and number two. And that, those are the only the variables that we need. So set number one, and then we're picking a number. These can be changed, but at the beginning, we're starting with 11 to 39. Set number two to a random number between 10 and 80. And then we're setting correct to number one plus number two. Now this, we can change out. We also have subtract number one from number two. We also have number one divided by number two. And then division. So we can pop any of the, or sorry, I've done that backwards. This is division, my apologies. Division is the, the slant symbol. And multiplication is the, uh, the asterisk. So one thing for students to troubleshoot, if they put the subtraction in, they will have to pick numbers to ensure that number one is a higher number than number two, or they'll, they'll run into some challenges. Unless they're doing negative integers, then, then they'll be fine. So set correct answer to, and for the first one here, I always start with addition. And then down here, Ask, and this is the where it's going to ask a question. Ask number one plus number two and wait. And then we have an if then else. If answer equals correct, then broadcast go. And broadcast go means that move 20 steps. And if that's not correct, if it isn't the correct answer, then say wrong for one second. And then it goes back up to the top. It picks this random number again, and random number again, and it asks the question again. So what does that look like? 31 plus 44. So if I type in 75, correct. And then my sprite has moved forward, 26 plus 79. So if I answer wrong this time, it says wrong and my sprite doesn't move across the stage. And I'll press stop here. Now, when the green flag is clicked, my butterfly goes back to the beginning. And the reason my butterfly does that is right here. When green flag clicked, go to X. And this position, I didn't have to figure it out. Wherever my sprite is currently on the stage, this block shows that. Go to minus 190x and y117. So that's where this position is right here on the screen. And if I move my, you'll see the numbers change if I move that sprite. They change down here at the bottom of the stage, but they also change in the blue coding blocks. And this makes it easier for students. And even if I move this around by accident, when I click the green flag, it goes back to the original position I want it to be at. Now what we need to do, we need to create the other competitor in this race. So to do that, we are going to go and pick new sprite from the library. Um, so I'll pick the cat. Click OK. There's my cat. You can see he's quite large. So again, I'll use the shrink tool. Put it in the middle of the cat. Shrink him down. 
about there. And then I'll drag them over here somewhere. And then for the students, I found that introducing more art really helped the students to be more creative. And the creative students that loved art became better coders because they were more interested in doing coding because I gave them more opportunities to do this. So if you switch over to costumes, I get rid of the second costume, and then we're going to create boxes. And if you're, I'm in vector mode, I'm going to actually convert to bitmap mode, and you do that down at the bottom here. I don't see any questions, so I'm going to keep going. So I'm going to draw a car, and I'm going to start with a rectangle. Now, I'm not a particularly great artist, so please excuse my uh, stumbling attempts here, but make a nice, cool-looking car. I'll click on a paint color and fill, oh, fill this whole box. Now, you do have to fill each part of the cat, which is semi-annoying, but such is life. And use a darker color. I'll use this right now. You can also paint if there's still things that aren't gone, and you can increase the width of your paintbrush. So you can get rid of all the little colors that remain, like so. And then the space is showing through, but I kind of want that. And then you can make the car more fancy, but for tonight I'm going to keep it fairly simple. And then we'll need wheels. You hold down shift to do a proper circle. So there's one wheel. I'm making these pretty basic, and I would encourage you to give your students time to do this. They will definitely be more creative than I'm being right now. And there. It's not perfect, but it'll get our car going for tonight. So now I've got the cat. Okay. So now what we want to do, again, we want to drag this sprite to where we want to start. So if you drag him over to here, now I'll notice that the go to X Y is going to be in that position. And if I'm not sure, I can double check by clicking the green flag, but it has put him in the right position. And then, next what we have to do is we have to get our cat moving across the screen as well. And as the competitor, the cat is going to continuously move across the screen from the very get-go. So I'm going to wrap in a forever block And I'm going to move. How many pixels I move each time will make the game more challenging or easier. So if we go with two steps, that's moving fairly slowly. And then the other option is putting a weight block in. And wait 0.5 seconds. And then the cat will continuously do that. So I can test it here. So the cat just keeps moving across the screen at a steady rate. And if I press the green flag again, he goes back to the beginning. So from here, I have to say, if touching the edge over here, I want to end the game. So if the cat does that, then unfortunately, the competitor has lost to the computer or the, the game. So if, and I click on sensing, touching, edge, and then I'm going to say, and I always get mixed up because it's, it's a sound, but it's really a visual, so it's a, it's a looks block. I'm going to say, good try for two seconds, or better luck next time, or there's lots of colorful phrases we could use. And then to test the program, we click the green flag again. Some students will run into a bug where if they're touching the edge over here because they've got their sprite too far over, then it won't work. And if that's the case, 
then all they have to do is, is move their sprite over slightly so that it's not touching the edge. And I was, I was walking through that not by telling them that, by saying, well, what does your code say? And then they say, well, go here and then move. And then I say, if touching edge, and I say, well, where's the edge? And then they show me the other side, say, well, where's another edge? And then that's when they usually figure it out. So if we run the program now, 32 plus 22, and that is 54. Correct. So then mine jumps ahead. And you see the cat's moving pretty quickly. So this would be a fairly challenging pace. This is where that design thinking comes in and you get your students to start to adjust the program for this different age groups. So I can have the my car move farther than 20 steps. I could slow down the cat. There's lots of ways that they can tweak it. Also, uh, we can change out this code here from plus to multiplying. So correct is number one times number two, but then they have to be careful to also change join number one and join number two. We're joining those with a symbol and we have to change it to a times table symbol. Now these are fairly challenging questions if we leave it as 11 to 39. And depending on the age of the students, that could be appropriate. But they might even want to just do the three and four times tables and go from one to seven if they're in grade three. And then that would look like this. 4 times 6, 6 times 4 is 24, and 3 times 1. And they just keep going across the stage. OK. Any questions about the racing car project? Okay. Uh, how's my speed? Is everything kind of digesting nicely? How are people feeling right now? Okay. Thanks, Melanie. Good. Awesome. OK. So taking the basic concepts from the racing car program, we can actually build a calculator. Oh, it does make sense when we see you do it. When I try it myself later, I'm sure we'll get stuck. That is the point. And the fun is figuring it out. Um, I myself have no background in computer science. I literally started learning this just because I saw a need for it for students and the importance of it uh, being a part of school. And yeah, you just learn as you go and you, you build up your, your understanding over time. But it, it really is, it's good to model that in front of the students too. And I'm, I'm always happy to say, I don't know. I don't know the answer yet, but let's figure it out. And, and so I think learning along with your students is, is more than acceptable. Thank you for that comment. Um, let's do the simple calculator, please, Trish. And Lisa is Lisa Floyd, who is my uh, uh, good friend who's much more knowledgeable than I and uh, is a fantastic educator. So if you ever have a chance to learn with her, she's phenomenal. Uh, she does a lot of great things around the province and across the country. She's uh, doing a lot of great things. So Lisa Floyd, and she's on Twitter. But um, I created my calculator, and I was feeling kind of proud. I said, look, Lisa, I made this. And within two seconds, she said, oh, why don't you do this? And she, she added to it. But the reason I'm including that here is, A, to show you that there's always someone to reach out to, uh, but also, B, for the students, they do the same thing. And so in sharing this with Lisa, she kind of said, well, here, why don't you have them click on these? And it's a bit more fluid. And I'll show you that in a couple of minutes. But the students do the exact same thing in my class all the time. 
And so I wanted to show you this example because it's the exact same thing that happens in the class. And by their genuine collaboration and working together, they are better for doing that. And one time one student will help them help, and then another time they'll get help from the student that they helped the time before. So we'll jump to the simple calculator now. Resume sharing. Good. Okay. And I'm thinking everyone's seeing the screen refresh okay. All right. So here's a simple calculator to do the four basic functions designed to show elementary students how a calculator functions at a basic level. And I'm always thinking at the primary level, so I, I never want to leave those students out because I think it's important to start this at the younger ages. So here, what is the first number? So if this is a calculator, it's really basic. What's the first number in the equation? So I'll make sure the first number is 5. And I press Enter. What's the second number? And you'll notice that number 1, it's now got 5 saved in that variable spot. So then here I'm going to say 6. Enter. Which operation? Press 1 for plus, 2 for minus, 3 for multiplying, and 4 for dividing. So dividing would be interesting, uh, but we won't use that today. We'll use multiplying, which is 3. And then it gives me my answer. So really basic, but it works. And so if I click on C inside, this is something that I could have students take on as a challenge. So button 1 doesn't actually do anything. All the code is here in the cat. Now button 1 will do something in a minute when you see uh, Lisa Floyd's, but here we go. So when green flag clicked, and again, we're going with data. So for data, I had to create answer, number one, number two, and an operation. And then in the code stack, set number one to zero, set number two to zero, set the operation to zero, and set the answer to zero. So those all have to be reset at the very beginning. And then, even though this looks like a lot of stuff, it's not as complex as it looks if we go through step by step. So ask, what's the first number, and wait. Set number one to answer. Ask, what is the second number? Set number two to answer. Ask which operation. Set operation to answer. And if answer equals one, so one meaning one up here, which is addition, then forever set answer to number one plus number two. So this here is explaining, it's an if then l, it's a nested if then else uh, uh, bunch of code here. So basically what it does is it's saying if the answer equals 1, which is addition, then do this, add 1 plus 2, number 1 plus number 2. Else, if answer equals 2, which is subtraction, forever set answer to number 1 minus number 2. If that's not true, then else, if answer equals 3, which is multiplying, forever set answer to number 1 times number 2. And then finally, else forever set answer to number 1 divided by number 2. And I don't have to put an answer equals this time because it understands. There was 1, 2, 3, or 4. And 4 is the final choice right here. So we don't require an additional block. That more or less makes sense, I'm hoping. Okay. And if we could now jump to Lisa's twist. Trish will put the link in, but that was my first try. And then have, there's Lisa's here. And see inside. Oh, wait, it's not shared, so you won't be able to see it, unfortunately. Hold on. I'll have to share this. No, this is just my version of it. Let's share. Okay. And the great thing about Scratch right here is it automatically 
when you remix something, it automatically gives credit for the students to where they got the original idea from. So it teaches us that whole concept of attributing your work and saying where you got things from and, and never stealing other people's ideas. So I could use someone else's idea, but I'm always saying this is who I got it from and this is the project I got it from so that we're giving credit to the person that gave us the original idea. So in Lisa's, for button one, she's changed it. So when this sprite is clicked, set answer to number one plus number two. So if I move to subtraction, set operation to two. And well, actually, we didn't, we didn't, she didn't finish. But so you can see here, but students could use this first uh, block of code, and then they could go through and code the other, the other keys, so that when you hit the plus symbol, it does the addition. When you hit the subtraction symbol, it does subtraction, multiplication, and division. So it just makes the program a little more streamlined. And it's 8.47. Are there any questions about what we've been looking at for the last few minutes? Okay, if your brains aren't totally full, I was going to show you one more thing tonight. Nobody's saying your brain's full, so that's good. Um, this is a problem that I introduce students to every year. And it's basically one of those old math um, folklore kind of, uh, you know, problems where they have to think. And it's actually a computational thinking problem. So they have to think computationally to figure this out. Does anyone know this, the farmer, the fox, and the chicken? Is anyone familiar with this uh, math problem? You can put a happy face on the slide or you can, Brenda, and okay, good. We have people that know of it. Excellent. And so for my students this year, after they figured out this problem, I said, you know what would be neat is if someone could figure out how to code it in Scratch. And of course, that set off a frenzy of students. I've seen one at Ted Edge using a zombie. Awesome. Okay, I would love to see that, actually. But um, mine, unfortunately, doesn't have a zombie. But that's pretty cool. So we'll jump to the project and then you have to go through one at a time. And this is me coding it, but I did have students working on it as well. And if Trish has already put the link in, so we can go there now. Okay. So, and here it explains the problem. So a farmer has a bag of grain, a chicken, and a fox. He has to transport all three across the river, but can only take one at a time across the river in the boat. If he leaves the chicken alone with the bag of grain, the chicken will eat the grain. If he eats the fox, if, sorry, if he eats, <laughs> if he leaves the fox alone with the chicken, the fox eats the chicken. How can he successfully get all three to the other side of the river? And he can only take one at a time across the river in the boat. And then I did state down here, I don't know the origin of this math question, but it's not my creation. That was all I could say because I genuinely don't know where it originally came from. So um, years ago, I saw this actually on the computer. And this was years ago, like at least a decade ago. And it was one of those math sites where they could do different things. And I, I just thought it was really cool. And I always wondered if, oh, there's the TED-Ed link. Thank you so much, Brenda. Um, so here, you can see, now this is my coding. I did have a student work on this as well. Um, and let's see, did he remix? No, that's me. That's the final copy. Okay. So he, he tried to build this as well, and he got really, really, really close. Um, so if you want to try this right now, especially if you don't know the answer, uh, to start here, you click the farmer, he'll hop in the boat, and you just got to pick something to go across with him. So 
naturally at the beginning, you pretty much kind of have to pick the chicken. And you'll take the chicken across, and then you just click on the boat. It's brought the chicken back. Again, take the chicken across again. <laughs> I think I'm not waiting long enough. One, two, three, four, five. No, it's not working. So let's go see what's not working. So the boat, when I received cross river, yeah, and green flag clicked. Okay, let's check the farmer out. When the sprite clicked, move across. Forever go to the boat, so you should follow the boat. Yeah, I'm not sure what we're doing wrong here. Okay, I'll try it again. So and this is the fun of it, although not when you're showing people, but and now the um, now things have disappeared. So there we go. So I can click the farmer again. So if I take him across by himself in the boat. Ah, oh, it's a space key, I'm sorry. Okay, if I take him across in the boat, you can see instantly, okay. The chicken got eaten by the fox, and the grain got eaten by the chicken. So it's the space bar to move the farmer. My apologies. I made this a little while ago, and I forgot. <laughs> so I click the farmer to get in the boat. I click the animal. He takes it across automatically. And then I simply press the space bar to come back. And I can get another creature to take across. So I apologize for that, but if you want to try it, See if you can get all three across the river without anybody eating anything. This is the part where I have no idea what people are doing because I can't see anyone, so hopefully you're trying to problem out. If you already know the solution, you should be able to get it pretty quickly. And if not, we'll walk through it before we leave the problem tonight. Stacy, are you trying the problem? Okay, good. This is kind of a fun math one. Brenda got it. Excellent. Of course, you had help from a zombie, I, I guess we could say. Thank you. Yay. Okay. So the two people who had done it before figured it out. Students hate this. Like, it drives them nuts. But this is one of those ways that I really get them to start thinking for themselves. So I won't give them the answer. And, and so it's, it's torturous for them, but I keep them thinking about it and trying it. And so my way of doing this formerly was just on a whiteboard. But having the program is actually helpful because it's, it's more visual and they can see things as it happens. And so I find it actually better than just doing it on paper or doing it on a whiteboard. So just being mindful of time, I'll just give people like 30 more seconds and then I'm going to just show how to get everything across. And if you're anything like me, you're probably really furiously trying to figure it out before you run out of time. Usually my students will work away at this for a good 45 minutes. Okay, and just being mindful of time. So my apologies if I'm kind of giving things away here, but we'll full screen it here. Okay, so I might choose to take the grain across next. After I take the grain across, I'm going to click back on the chicken and bring the chicken back across. And then I'm going to click on the fox and take the fox across. 
And then I'm going to go back and finally grab the chicken. Ta-da! So the, the key is to understand that you can only take one thing in the boat at a time, but he can take something back. And then as soon as students figure that out, they're, they very quickly figure out the problem. I love the zombie one. I'm going to check that one out for sure. So that's essentially what I have for you tonight. I hope it was helpful. I hope there was something in there you could take back to your classroom and use. Uh, if you have questions later, please hit me up on Twitter. If you're trying some of these and something's not working, I'll do my best to help you. I'm a classroom teacher, but I'm always happy to, when I can, like jump in and, and help. So I may not answer you instantly, but I would get back to you in a half hour or an hour or so, I would be able to get back to you. So, any questions before we finish tonight? Thank you for your kind words. Uh, Brenda, there are. Um, Absolutely. Do you know what? I'm going to give Trish the links and we'll put them in the we'll put them in the links that she shares with people. That's good to hear, Stacy. Um, I do have I can tell you actually I've got a couple on the shelf here. Hold on a second. No, actually, I took them home. My daughter wanted to work on some projects. Uh, she's nine and she loves this stuff. So, um, do you find your students code their school projects at home? Absolutely, they do. That's a good link, Brenda. Um, I I will give a couple of book suggestions, and we'll put those in the links for you. And I'll get those for Trish uh, tonight or tomorrow morning, and those will be available to you. But these are not expensive books. They're $20, $24. You can buy them at Chapters. You can buy them at Amazon. They're not difficult to get at all, and they're excellent. There's a more advanced one if you do a lot of, a lot of coding and you really want to understand how Scratch starts to relate to, um, to real, not real, but like to more advanced coding languages. It starts to kind of put things in perspective. That was very helpful for me once I kind of had a, a my feet under me with Scratch, it really kind of helped me to see how it connects to to the more mature coding languages. And I'll, I'll give you that link as well. Okay, Brenda, yeah, I'll share that. And it's, it's a great book. In fact, I just wish I could remember the name of it. But it, it's sitting at home, so I'll definitely get that, those links. All your book links, yes. Oh, actually, here. Um, if you type in this bitly here, um, that should take you to, This is just a, a page I built with some coding projects on it. You can do with your students. There's video tutorials. And then there's also, I don't really have a short form for this one. I'll just check. Maybe I have a bit.ly. OK. Um, here's the second one you could use. And it's coding projects all the way from grade 1 to grade 6 in math and language. So let me just throw that up for you as well. So uh, if you use those two links, it will take you to a bunch of projects you could use. And I'll get those book links to you as well. 
Okay, Trish. All right, Scott, looks great. I can see that some people are still uh, writing in there, so I'll do my thing and Scott will keep uh, answering what's going on here. So that gets us to the end here and uh, I'm just going to stop the recording right now, I think. Um, but we have been putting all these links in there, so here we go.